This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We are blessed with majestic mountains, beautiful forests, rivers, and a spectacular wild coastline, all 19,000 kilometres of it. I'm Craig Potton, and like many New Zealanders, I actually learnt to swim not long after I could walk. I'm a photographer, a conservationist, and a surfer, and I just love the coast. I like exploring above it and in the water. On my coastal journeys, I'll encounter some wonderful sea creatures. I'll visit people that care for the coast, and I'll try to understand its place in our culture and our duty of care for it. The west coast of the South Island stretches 600 kilometres along some of the most untamed and sparsely populated coast in New Zealand. This is the wild west coast. It's a place of sublime beauty and raw energy and raw power. That's the Tasman Sea out there. It's part of the world's largest ocean. Behind me, the magnificent Rimu Forest. They stretch almost untouched all the way to the highest mountains in New Zealand. The west coast has the best of what's left in our wilderness coastline. On this journey, we're travelling from the coastal plains of Haast, up the west coast of the South Island, to the northernmost tip at Farewell Spit. We'll follow the westerly weather cycle as it flows northwards from southwestern's forested sand dunes to the sculpted forms of Punakaiki's limestone formations. We'll meet people who have themselves been shaped by the coast and its weather before ending at a place very close to my heart, the long stretching arm of Farewell Spit. My journey starts on the southwestern coast, just north of the Haast River at Arnott's Point, where ancient basalt boulders rise dramatically from the sea. It's a steep climb from the main road down to the beach. Sometimes just getting to the wilder parts of our coasts it can be an adventure in itself. Botanist Jerry McSweeney is an old friend, and in the 1970s, Jerry and I were part of a group fighting to protect this pristine southwestern coastline with its ancient wetlands and forests. Thankfully, we succeeded, and it was fully protected. So it's a pretty complex geology around here. Yeah, it's a remarkable piece of coast and really sandwiched into this kilometre or so across is the whole of New Zealand's history for the last 70 million years. We've got um, Antarctica was joined to this point and then it pulled apart. We've got basalts or volcanic rocks have squeezed up. So we've got limestone out there, the volcanic rocks, which are very hard, and then softer rocks back in here, which are sandstones full of fossils. What about this, Jerry? Ah, well, this is one of the ancient sandstones it used to be connected to Australia, Antarctica, until we split off from Gondwanaland. This separation occurred around 85 million years ago. We can actually see the fossilised worm traces. Um, this is called a weathering rind, this outer bit, like on a cheese. Yep. And then we've got these, imagine a whole lot of mud and worms sort of crawling through it, digesting the organic matter and leaving behind these little traces. So we can actually date this rock from the fossils. We, we've got a beautiful stream here just showing you all the colours of rocks that you find on this wild piece of coast. Beautiful ball though, isn't it? Yeah. With that rock jammed in there. This piece of coast carries stories not just about ancient geological history, but more recent human history too. So this is the cave? This is the cave. This is John Boltby's cave from 1813. Wow. First point of contact between Maori and European on the west coast. They were killing seals all up this coast, based out of Open Bay Islands. They came in, camped here, were attacked in the middle of the night, and half the group were killed. The amazing thing is, from such a, an awful history, we've actually got this whole landscape restoring itself. The seals have come back. We've got black oyster catchers. We've got elephant seals here. This is one of the few places in New Zealand you can find elephant seals. Normally, you'd have to go way to the uh, sub-Antarctic islands to see elephant seals, but they're actually regularly here every year for 20 years. These are the guys with the real big snouts. Huge, great <laughs> snouts, and they're, they're, as someone said, only their mother would love them, but uh, they are amazing animals. 
We've got the world's rarest penguin, which is called Tawaki or Fjord and Crested Penguin. They nest in the rainforest along this coast between July and December. And, you know, it's so uncanny to see a penguin nearly a metre high walking up the beaches and nesting in the jungle. So it's a pretty wild place to come to, but an incredible coast. Well, it's not only got that whole human history, you know, our settlement dimension, but it's also now protected as a World Heritage Site because it recognises that we've got vast forests to the east of us here that are untouched. This sequence of coast to forest to mountains is repeated in many places up the west coast. And one stunning example is here at Ship Creek. It always amazes me how you can walk from the beach, through the sand dunes, and then magically you're in a thick forest. So that's the sea just over there, but we're in a forest. I know, it's amazing. We're, we're 50 metres from the sea. We can hear the sea in between the sand dunes. You get these areas where the compost all accumulates and there's just this huge explosion of life. Um, we've got the, the first of all kiki, superjack, flax, and then we've got forest giants, like I can see little Rimu kahikatea, the, the tallest trees of the forest. And as we go another 100 metres back, we'll discover tall forests of Rimu and kahikatea. But I mean, in all intents and purposes, it's a jungle. You get off this track here, we'd, we'd be in tiger country. Yeah, people think that the Amazon is the sort of the, the epitomizes jungle, but this is as thick as you'll find in any tropical rainforest anywhere in the world. And if you tried to go through this without a track, you'd be walking for days. Trapped between old sand dune beaches are large lakes, and on misty days, they're astonishingly beautiful and I'm compelled to take some images. Dune lakes were once common in New Zealand, but in most other parts of the country, they've been drained for farms or cities. Here, the wetlands, as well as the rainforest, have been preserved. Further inland, but still very close to the sea, are some of the last remaining ancient kahikatea and rimu forests. These lowland forests, with their flax, swamps and giant trees, give us a window into a world which existed long before humans ever stepped onto our shores. We are entering an ancient, pre-human paradise on Earth. Yeah, it's amazing. You don't want to disappear and mud up to your neck. This is the next stage for those little seedlings that we saw, the kahikatea and the rimu, have now grown into these giant trees. Look at them. Some people call it the dinosaur forest. Why do they refer to it that way? The most ancient uh, tree that we found in fossils is this kahikatea, and it was growing at the time the dinosaurs walked the earth. So it's kind of like evolution slowed down. Is that a reasonable way to put it? Yeah, well, a famous uh, botanist actually said it's the nearest thing you come to going to another planet on earth, you know, to come in here. And the thing is, of course, it's also, although we're right near the coast, we're right at sea level, it's, it's unmodified completely. So this is what would have greeted the first Polynesians when they arrived on the beach, or, or in fact greeted Cook and his men when they arrived into the remote places like Fiordland. And you took one of the most famous rainforest photographs in New Zealand, about 100 metres away from us here, uh, which was Rainforest Ship Creek, which has adorned so many different things. When I first came here a long time ago, I was probably about 18, 19 years old, and I guess the fact that I came aware of the fact that it was not protected, it was going to be an area that was up for logging, heightened my awareness of how extraordinarily beautiful and how different it was. It's life on life on life, so that the trunk's got mosses on it, the mosses have got a liverwort on it, they've got a little berry from a flower from some other species. Often photographers talking about keeping things simple, kiss, keep it simple. Here you can't keep it simple, it's just blatantly complicated. That's what's exciting about working here. It isn't easy to take good photographs in forests like this, but when you get a good one, you feel good. The south of the west coast has some of New Zealand's most extreme weather. Huge coastal surges, violent thunderstorms, and of course, you don't get rainforests without heavy rain. 
The weather on the coast, it can come in extremes. I'm at the mouth of the Hokitika River, and most days, well, it's pretty fine down here, not like today, but up there, 14 metres of rain have fallen some years in the Crop River. That's a record for New Zealand. Mark Crompton, or Swampy as he's known here, has been forecasting the weather on the coast for 40 years. He's based at Hokitika Airport, and each day he conducts weather tests to feed into the National Meteorological Data Bank. Over the years, he's seen many severe weather events on the coast. We can uh, here at Hokitika Airport get up to 150 millimetres in 24 hours. The rainfall increases as you go south, and the, the band of heaviest rain actually falls in an area over the western foothills of the Southern Alps. It's in that uh, band of heavy rain inland, on the western foothills, there are um, rain gauges that record in excess of 10,000 millimetres. These towns are often near rivers, and obviously the, the question there is how often and when will the flood come through? When the weatherman brings the rain... When the rains come, they fall hardest at the mid-level foothills of the Southern Alps, and within hours, the water is raging down to the coast. The towns below sit alongside rivers, so it's no surprise that locals have lived with a history of floods. On two separate days in 1988, nearly two-thirds of a metre of rain fell in 24 hours in Greymouth. Enough was enough. And in 1990, Greymouth built a seven-kilometre flood wall to hold back the mighty Grey River. There's also a strangely beautiful wind and fog effect in Greymouth. It's a notoriously bitter wind that comes down the river, marked by a trail of white mist, and it's called the barber. It's a, what's known as a catabatic wind, and because of the topography at Greymouth, the Grey River, it's almost like a, a small uh, gorge there. All that cold air flows out through that gap. And, and it cuts right through you, hence it's called the barber. Uh, uh, yes, yes. And I believe it's the only wind with a name. Yes, as far as I know, it's the only wind in New Zealand with its own name. So, like, you've got the Canterbury Northwester or the Wellington Southerly, but the barber up there in Greymouth has its own name, uh, a bit like the Mistral in France or the Sirocco coming out of Africa. And occasionally, in images in our newspapers around New Zealand, we see a tornado forming off the coast somewhere in this sort of area. What's causing them? Yeah, the ones we get here are, are fairly minor, but nonetheless, even a, a minor tornado can still cause a lot of damage. I remember uh, three or four years ago, a tornado went through Greymouth, cut a swathe, I think, about a kilometre long and about 200 metres wide. It, I think it de-roofed several houses. But I guess there's got to be a plus side to the rain. I mean, it, it does bring some of the features that we love the coast for, doesn't it? Well, and indeed it does. Um, if it wasn't for the rain, uh, we wouldn't have the things that people come to Westland to see, the rainforest, uh, the lakes, the rivers, the glaciers. This is what people come here to see. And if it wasn't for the rain, they wouldn't be there. So we should be celebrating it, the we way. We should celebrate the rain. And I, I tell the locals this, the rain is to be celebrated. Perched on the edge of the coast of Whakapohai Beach, alongside the flood-prone river, is the Waibers' home. It's in a precarious position, sitting in the path of any passing storm. Barry. Yeah. Good to see you. It's good to meet you. Barry Weiber has lived here for the last 40 years. So you're living right on the edge of the wildest coastline in New Zealand. You've got one of the wilder rivers, not a big one, but one that would no doubt in floods come down here. Why'd you pick this spot? I don't know, really. It's <laughs> just a appealed to us. Yeah. <laughs> Must have been a good day when we first looked at it. Right. <laughs> it may have been a good day when he arrived, but over the years, Barry has seen his fair share of wild weather. You can see the size of the rocks out there, and I've seen them completely disappear in the troughs. On a typical day, the waves out here can average three metres, and sometimes they can go as high as ten. And, and you just wonder how they could pull up before they got to the house, but... And well, how do they pull up before they... I mean, this is the lawn. We're standing on the lawn of your yeah. house. There's actually a dip down there towards your house. Yeah. 
It has run over that a few times. Has it? Yeah. We were in bed and um, I could hear things crashing around outside and I thought it was just the wind blowing the rubbish buckets around and, and obviously went back to sleep and the house was thumping and banged. <laughs> And then when I got up in the morning, I couldn't believe it. Just been pouring under the house and, and right round to the back door. We couldn't get anything up the road. The road had gone, the, it had washed the road out. At least with the river, you can try and do something with it, but the sea, you can do nothing, you know? Yeah. Just at the mercy of the waves, really. And since the swells are often so high, fishing boats could seldom be launched directly off the beach. You have to have a bit of cunning to survive these conditions. And this was the magnificent solution. Barry's boat's flying fox. Um, it would take us about halfway to the rock and we'd lower it down and go fishing. And then when we come back, we'd lift the boat up and drag it back up onto the beach. Looked a bit Mickey Duck, but it actually worked. Any days it didn't work where you clicked it on and nothing happened? Yeah, not, not too many. <laughs> yeah, a couple of times I'd have to swim ashore. Swim ashore? Yeah, and jack something up. I wouldn't swim ashore through some of those waves out there. Oh, well, <laughs> some, sometimes you just had to. But in all seriousness, Barry, I mean, this castle of yours, it really is in a precarious position, isn't it? Yes. You acknowledge yes. that? Yep. Yeah, and uh, one day, mighty Mother Nature. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. This might come Yeah. In. Coming up what I think is the most beautiful coastal highway in New Zealand, the Punakaiki coastline. And I'm going to meet my mate Andy Dennis up here. In 1987, Paparoa National Park was established. Again, not without a long fight. Andy was another protesting buddy, and it was over 30 years ago that we first discovered the treasures of this coastal strip. What do we got here? I've just been uh, having a wee natter with a weka while, while I've been waiting for you to arrive, yeah. It's good to be back here, isn't it? Yeah. Always is. Looks very familiar. You always talk about the kind of denseness of coastal tangles here. Imagine Heafy and Brunner trying to hack their way through this stuff. Putting the steps up here just... You can't come to this part of the west coast without stopping at the pancake rocks of Punakaiki. This geological masterpiece attracts 600,000 people a year from all over the world for good reason. The symmetrical limestone formations were formed 30 million years ago, and over time, rain, percolating water, and the sea have sculpted them into these remarkable forms. This is an extraordinary landscape, isn't it? What causes the layering, Andy? Well, uh, for many years, Craig, when I first came here, I thought this was different sediments being washed down in some strange an annual cycle. But it's actually happened three or 400 metres under the seabeds. So what's caused it to come up? I mean, it's above the ocean here. Earth lift, tectonic plates coming together. At the time the stuff was formed, there were no mountains in New Zealand. The New Zealand was a low-lying archipelago of islands. Maybe even the whole country went under the sea 30 million years ago. And nearly all the sediments were made up of lime, calcium carbonate, and that's why you get limestones. And when the land came up, there were limestones all over New Zealand and these wonderful eccentric landscapes. But along this piece of coastline, you can find sculpted rocks just as spectacular, with a lot fewer people around. 
Andy and I are kayaking up the Pororari River to visit some old haunts. These little alcoves of the dry arc. That, in that clean beige sandstone in the alcoves and everything else sort of stained in that black tannin yeah. water. Look at the way these mosses come down where the, where the sort of continuous of trickles are. We've spent a lot of time here over the years discovering the beauty of this coastline. Andy writing two books, and it's where I started seriously taking photographs. This is, this is wave cut. It's amazing how these canyons have formed, the result of water constantly working on them over thousands of years. The river winds up into the Paparoa National Park, and the limestone which underlies most of the park fosters an incredibly abundant subtropical forest. Good way to see the canyons, Andy. It is, Craig, especially on a day like this. But, um, yeah, you get close to this stuff, like, oh, look at all this kia kia on this side. Oh, this is lowland forest, and it was lowland forest that we set about to save because, well, it just wasn't represented, this sort of forest in the national park system before places like Paparoas. So the syncline sits in behind here, and that's where the really rich forest is, isn't it? Yes, it's a sort of shallow trough, probably several kilometres, up to six or seven, probably in the limestone behind here, and there's a whole mosaic of forest there. Just all different types on different soils and things, and some of the richest forests that we've got on the west coast are most diverse. What to me today, some 30 years after the big battles to save this area, is we would now consider, and I think most New Zealanders, inconceivable that they even thought of logging that, really, isn't it? It is. Just up the road from the Pororari River is Truman's track. This track to the beach goes through lush coastal forest with large podocarps, including rata, rimu, kahikatea, matai, and glades of subtropical niko. Well, Andy, it still looks pretty similar. This is one of my favourite trees anywhere in the country, I think, anywhere. Yeah, it's the rata, isn't it, and the matai, and just the way they co-join there, it's just wonderful. Yeah, you've got, it's, it's matai, and you can see that because it's got that hammer-dented bark on it. And then this thing, this is northern rata, started life as a little seed up there in the, in the crest of the tree, and these are aerial roots sent down. And, it, I mean, this could have been here hundreds of years. Matai could be five, could be 800 years old, gradually encircling it. And so close to the coast. What, five minutes from the sea here? Maybe seven from the top of the cliffs. And, and you know, you see as you go down here, we go through this forest, then we get into that, that Kamahi, Toro, Quintinia forest, very pole forest, little trees, not nearly as big as this, then down into the Manuka and flax, then out onto those mats of, of herbs just above the sea. It's a bit of a swell running, Andy, not big. Yes. Reasonably modest, Craig, compared to some of the ones we've had here. Is there a surf in that today, do you think? First time we walked this, we thought it was one of the greatest coastal walks I think we'd ever done. Still do, mate, still, still do. do yeah. You arrive under a cliff face like this on this wonderful coastal landscape and you feel like taking a photograph, but you want to get a sense of scale into it. Those are magnificent big cliffs up here. Andy, can I use you for a sense of scale? Scale. Scale, <laughs> Andrew. If you toodle off down there. Toodle off. Toodle off, please. And if I can get you down there and looking up. How far? Seriously, like you're contemplating the wonders of nature. Yeah, yeah. I'll yell. You just run. I'll yell. Run! <laughs> yeah, run, my friend. <laughs> well, wander along quickly. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Hey, a bit further, mate. Good one. Yeah, a little bit further. Out a bit. Yeah, cool. Actually, Andy's done the trick, making a, uh, a big landscape even bigger by him being smaller. 
Hey, Andy. Cheers, mate. Thank you. For some strange reason, I have this compulsion when I'm walking along beaches to pick up rocks. Often sort of egg-shaped ones, sometimes ones with, with lions through them, ones like these ones. In fact, I'm not the only person with that sort of compulsion. It's always nice to meet up with another beach rock enthusiast like Mary Trays. I've called into Nine Mile Beach, just north of Greymouth, to meet up with her. Looking down the beach, you know, you get this idea that it's all grey and, and, and everything's grey and it, it, it's quite boring or monotonous. But then if you stand and look down, you see that there's quite a few different colours within the rocks. There's more than meets the eye here. All sorts of rocks and minerals coming down from the rivers and glaciers are dragged north onto these beaches. You have picked out greenstone. That's your favourite one to find, is it? Panamu, yes, we find Panamu on this beach. It gets washed up from the Hokitika or Arahura rivers. My daughter and I have a Christmas tradition. We go for a walk always, and sometimes it's on, on the beaches. So on Christmas Day, 1999, this is my millennium piece. You found that on Christmas Day? Yes, it was well, a lovely present. It's especially special. I think she wanted me to give it to her, but I, <laughs> I no kept way. it for me. But in 1864, another treasure was discovered along this coast, and that was gold. From 1864 to 1867, prospectors poured in. Gold towns boomed along the coast, and the total population went from a few hundred to 30,000 people. Some of that mining happened on the black sands of these beaches. The gold pushed northwards by a phenomenon called the longshore drift. I've done some surf casting on this beach, yep. and you can stand here on a day when the sea doesn't look that rough out there, does it? No. Nah, and you can day. throw your line out with a big, heavy sinker on it, yep. and have the have the, the the line back on the beach within about a minute, because the drift just goes zzz, around. You drift up the coast. You throw it out again, <laughs> it's back again. Back again. <laughs> Here's how longshore drift works. Driven by westerly winds, waves break at an angle on the beach, pushing the sand along too. As the wave recedes, the sand tumbles straight down, only to be picked up by the next wave and pushed along a little further. In this way, hundreds of thousands of cubic metres of sand are shifted northwards each year. So would it be too fanciful of me to ask that some of this sand would actually get all the way up to Fairwell Spit? I mean, I've got my holiday home up there, and that, that's where I come from. And I sometimes like to think that maybe the top of Mount Cook's crashed off, a bit of rocks come down the Cook River, and it's been gradually taken all the way up to Fairwell Spit. Yep, that's quite possible, very possible. That's right, because next time when you climb Mount Cook, you can microchip a rock up there and set it off on its travels, and you know, you... Well, take, how long do you guess? Take a wild guess. A long time. <laughs> Artist John Crawford and his wife Anne have lived across the road from Nakawo Beach, just north of Westport, for 30 years. Together they produce a range of beautiful ceramics. John is also a painter and much of his work is inspired by this coastal environment. Hello Craig, come on into the studio. I've got a little white rock for you. Oh, lovely. Well John, I'm... Absolutely delighted that you collect white rocks because I'm obsessed by them. I've got 10,000 at home, never knowing quite what to do with them, but, but you actually use them. Oh, I said about just drawing these rocks um, and finding some of the energies in it. So the drawings themselves are incredibly simple, positive, negative, round squares. But what's even more interesting about these two drawings is that they are drawings about this white stone are made by a white stone. So the green has been placed first down and then the image itself is turned over and the stone is then rubbed backwards and forwards and you're left with this rather beautiful pattern of the water uh, given the same energy as the stone. The Crawfords comb the beaches every day in search of new treasures. The objects they find inspire new projects. 
one of the things about my walking on the beach is that I'm a collector of what you might call small realities. The pattern you will see on the sand as the tide is out and on a very calm day, the ocean will leave these very beautiful marks along the edge and you can actually walk along them. It can be a little game you can play. Each morning I try to sort of find three things and those three things I might bring back and draw into workbooks. That's an obsession. I mean, three things. Why not four? Why not seven the next day? Do you rigorously sort of force yourself into that sort of discipline for artistic reasons or just because you're a strange obsessive? Uh, probably a little bit of both. Um, the, a strange obsessive has a lot to do with it. Don't worry, we do have a rock release day every now and then. Did you actually pick here on this little coastal highway with the beach over there because you wanted to work as an artist for it? Or did it, in a sense, pick you and you loved the place and then your art came from just observing it? It is a particularly beautiful place because of its intensity with the height of the mountains and the in incredible energy of the ocean. And um, it was quite inexpensive to buy when we first bought because no one, when we bought in the 70s, wanted to actually live by the ocean. Uh, you know, only bohemians and, and unemployed people lived by the ocean because your car rusted. <laughs> I'm now travelling to Whanganui Inlet near the top of the west coast of the South Island. This is one of the larger estuaries in the South Island and parts of it are in pristine condition. We have even created a marine reserve in the southern half. It's also the place where a surprising prehistoric discovery has been made. Greg Brown is a geologist and was researching the rocks and sediments in Whanganui Inlet in the mid-90s when he found a series of mysterious imprints. So it's somewhere around here, Greg? Yeah, just coming up, Craig. Yeah, so just over here on this old surface here. So this here? This is a dinosaur's footprint. Yep, it is. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, cool. isn't it? So oh, 70 it's... million years ago, these huge animals were roaming around a mudflat, much like we have today in the modern um, Wanganui Inlet, um, making these footprints. Just a perfect facsimile that it happened, and then within minutes, literally, the mud came in, as probably an incoming tide came in, and just covered these footprints with, with a layer of mud and just, just preserved them beautifully. Didn't erode them, didn't modify them, just perfect. The imprints are roughly circular in shape, and to the untrained eye, it would not be immediately obvious that they are footprints. For Greg, it took years of discounting all other possibilities before he could confidently say dinosaurs made them. It's like reading a book. You're a detective trying to solve a crime scene, is what I always liken it to. You know, some of these are 60 centimetres wide. So it's a big animal. Could be big. So is it a fish? Probably not that. Mammals? Well, 70 million years ago, the mammals were all very small. So then you're really left with reptiles. And what were living at that time? Well, obviously the dinosaurs. The only type of dinosaurs that has much more of a club-like footprint are the sauropods. So, there must be sauropods. It was the last thing I was expecting to see. <laughs> These gigantic plant eaters were among the largest creatures that have ever lived and could grow up to 45 metres in length and weigh over 100 tonnes. For such a large creature, these hoof-like footprints are relatively small. Greg Brown figures that these would most likely have come from a small dinosaur of the sauropod family. How do you read particular blobs to yep. give you more information about the size of the beast or the, you know, the, whether it's the heel or the front? In this particular case, and in many of these examples, we can tell which is the heel and which was the toe, because um, when your foot strikes the beach um, or the sand, it leaves a very clean cut. We know that that was the heel and this was the toe and it was moving that way. Although dinosaur bones are only known from two places on mainland New Zealand, it is clear that most of the main groups of dinosaur, including theropods, which walked on two legs and were carnivores, as well as the large plant-eating sauropods, lived here before they became extinct over 65 million years ago. 
but this is the first evidence that they roamed the South Island. I've always loved this place. I've photographed those forests behind there quite a lot, and this primeval ooze of the mud, it's appealing to me. And it comes as a marvellous surprise that it's in this vast vicinity that we've found dinosaur footprints more recently. And it gives me cause for wonder that what we described as dinosaur forest actually is very much what it was like 70 million years ago. Now we've reached Farewell Spit, a place I have a huge affection for, having spent many summers here. The arching arm of Farewell Spit forms the northern side of Golden Bay and is the longest sand spit in New Zealand, stretching for about 26 kilometres. It's a while since I've been out to the end point, and that's where I'm heading today. Pretty cool place to come out in the morning, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Paddy Galuli is someone who knows and loves this area well. Most days, his company drives down the spit taking tours. Only two registered companies are allowed on the spit. How long have you been doing the trips? Uh, 25 years this year, Craig. Started in 1986. Do they make a cake for you because you've been doing it for 25 years? No, but we had a party at 20. The lighthouse hasn't changed since my last trip here. In fact, it hasn't changed for over 100 years. But it's not the original one. So when was this one actually built, this version? This version was carried along here to the end of the spit by sea in 1897. And before that? There was a wooden one here, uh, but it couldn't hack it. Um, the sand and the wind and everything just blew it to bits, really. Because that's something that's quite neat about this one. It exposes the structure that it's built for, really, and it, I mean, it allows the air through, but I think it looks pretty structural. It's sort of got that. Oh, it's good. Yeah. yeah. It's got that sort of New York skyscraper look. Yeah. And, you know, a hundred and something years out here on the end of the spit, it's proved that it was a good idea. The sand just sweeps through here on a windy day. Sweeps through. So the spit itself, do you think it's growing? Do you think it's getting smaller? What, what sort of changes have you seen? It's getting fatter, and it's getting a little bit longer. Yep. and it's growing on the inside as well. One of the best indications is that little wharf just out there where the um, surf boats used to land the supplies for the lighthouse keeper. It was built in the 1930s on the high tide mark. Now you've got to go 100 metres or more to the high tide mark. You think about that, it's less than your lifetime. It's made that much difference. Yeah. I mean, in a 1,000 years, will it, will it reach Nelson? <laughs> no. <laughs> it'll... it'll fill up Golden Bay a bit, but no, it's not going to go that far. <laughs> Shame, really. It'd be a nice trip. So in the old days, a lot more coastal shipping than we get today. Do you know roughly how many boats have hit this? There's records of it? about 20. Some of them short term, but some of them long term. Yeah. Some still there. Yeah. Only one of those 20 wrecks is currently exposed, and I'm keen to see it. This ship has been here for over a hundred years, but because of the constant longshore movement bringing sand up the coast and the relentless westerlies rolling the sand dunes over the spit, she's only uncovered sometimes. It seems like I'm only just in time to see her. We won't see this for a while. This dune's coming forward, it's going to cover up the shipwreck and it'll be under there for about 15 years. You're saying that because of the westerly drift... Yeah, that's covers. right, probably within a matter of weeks and then 15 years' time, out the other end. So if I come back in exactly 15 years' time, I'll see it. How do you know that's 15 years it's going to come open again? Because uh, they do 30 metres a year. We know how big, how wide the dunes are, we know how fast they move, and that's how long it takes. Might hold you to that. I might just come back and check whether your numbers are right. Yeah, it's a date. <laughs> It's not just ships that have fallen victim to the shallow and sometimes lethal waters of the spit. This is also one of the main places in New Zealand where whales strand. Since 1991, there have been 33 strandings on the spit, and I've been there for a number of them. Okay. That's okay. 
a lot of people out there, started helping, getting them out, and um, worked them off to the ocean, but whether they'll stay out there or not. Yeah. Any dead ones? Yeah, I think there's five, maybe six that are uh, already dead. But the rest of them look relatively healthy, so hopefully. It's a very emotional experience when the whole community gets out to try and rescue these magnificent mammals. The long-finned pilot whales are the most common whales to be beached in strandings. Disease, difficulties giving birth, old age and navigational errors are all potential causes for whales beaching themselves. But what makes them strand in huge numbers is their group behaviour. When one strands, it sends out a distress call to its family members. They come to help, get stranded, and in turn call their extended family. Soon, the entire related pod is beached. We try to keep the whales hydrated and then to refloat them on the high tide. It's always touch and go as to whether they make it, but when they do, it's an incredible feeling. I have one last place to visit before leaving the spit, and that's the impressive, ever-changing sand dunes. In some places, the dunes are as high as 20 metres. So this sand has come all the way off the mountains of the Southern Alps, into the rivers, down into the ocean, and the Westland Current carries it along the spit, and it gets formed into the big dunes by the wind. That's a longshore drift at its best, isn't it, really? It sure is. Oh, if we can get up these dunes. <laughs> Come on, <old> man. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I still feel a bit of a kid, you know, and I get to a dune like this, I actually just want to leap down it. Well, don't let me hold you back. Where you go? Oh, come on, mate. You're, uh, you're still young, aren't you, at heart? Right. Only just. <laughs> <laughs> right, race you then. It's a little bit harder today, but um, yeah, here we go. Here we go. See you later. <laughs> I'm at the northernmost tip of the South Island. Out there is Kaharangi National Park. It's got more plants and animals than any other national park in New Zealand. And over here, Fariki Beach, and somewhere over there, my secret surfing spot. And in front, Farewell Spit. What is it about this place that so inspires me? I come here often to take photographs. The meeting of the sea and the land, the overarching sky, the godlike finger of Farewell Spit reaching out, and I'm not the first to have come here. I'm sure it was from this place that Colin McCann was inspired to paint his magnificent The Promised Land. McCann worked on other major paintings which acknowledged that just as we humans do, our animals need what he called a necessary protection landscape so they could breed and flourish in peace. I hope we too can develop a more protective ethic, a softer hand, towards the birds, the fish, the ocean, and its interface with the land that McCann and we New Zealanders cherish so much. <laughs>